From the Whiskey Tangent Studios in Marlton, New Jersey, this is Whiskey Tangent News. Hey everybody, this is Ed from the Whiskey Tangent Podcast, back with another edition of Whiskey Tangent News. Joining me as always is Scott. Hey everybody. And we have some great whiskey industry news stories for you. Mm. For them coming up, we got some entertainment stories involving whiskey. We got a couple of them for you. Yeah. We even got the ever popular true crime whiskey stories. Three of them. Mm. And after we clear our news stories of the month, Scott's going to tell you the new whiskeys coming out that we are featuring this month on the news. Mm -hmm. 13 of them. And then we'll tell you what's coming up in the next few weeks, including a very special whiskey. Quick taste. So, Scott, (laughs) take it away. You are so excited. I I love it. I am. Uh, So, first, a little podcast production note. Yes. That we did not put out an August news episode. There just wasn't enough news and enough new whiskeys at the time, so we felt like we shouldn't do it. It's no different than your company that where everyone goes on vacation and no one does any work in August. Let's be honest. August is a down month. Yeah, we took a siesta. Right, so we're not going to just go out there and make news up, so we're going to combine some of the August stories that mattered. They're going to find their way into the September news, and here we go. Yes, right. So it is September 2024, and here's all the news that's fit to drink. In industry news, we have four stories. The first story is from Forbes magazine. Seven distilleries announce a new whiskey alliance. Ooh. Yeah. This is interesting. The Federation. (laughs) The University of Kentucky, in partnership with seven distilleries, both large and small, have just established a new whiskey alliance whose aim is to create and adjudicate requirements for whiskeys to be certified as quote unquote estate whiskeys. Called the Estate Whiskey Alliance, the seven founding members are Heaven Hill, in Bardstown, Thousand Acres, also of Bardstown, Maker's Mark from Loretto, Kentucky, Peterson Farms, also from Loretto, Kentucky, Western Kentucky Distilling of Beaver Dam, Kentucky, Hill Rock Estate from Ancrum, New York, and Black Fox Farm from Saskatchewan, Canada. Next year, the Alliance plans to release an estate whiskey certified logo that can be used only on whiskey bottles that meet the Alliance's two simple requirements. Number one, all milling, mashing, fermenting, and distilling occurs on land owned by the distillery. And two, at least two-thirds of the grains used are grown on land owned by that distillery. This, of course, is in stark contrast to the large-scale production of whiskey in which distillers demand uniform ingredients to create a consistent product, which restricts what varieties of corn, rye, barley, and wheat they can work with, and by extension, which geographic areas they're able to source from. But a state-certified whiskey will expose consumers to rare, innovative, and heirloom grain varieties and give them a chance to experience the varying terroir of far-flung distilleries that not only create different flavors in Influenced by the soil and weather unique to their farms, but also the differences between grains grown at different locations on the same farm. Interesting, but the way you said it is land owned by the distillery. Mm-hmm. So a place like Hill Rock, they could own all their land in New York, but they could also own plots in Kentucky. They could also own plots in Iowa. They could own plots in Canada. So sure. I like the mentality behind it, I think, but the curiosity I have is why so few and why so scattered? Like, if it's such a good idea, I love that Maker's Mark and Heaven Hill are there. Yeah. But where's Woodford? They already do all that. Yeah. So basically what it said to me, but they're trying to put together like a grain to glass certification. Right. So if you're not in that alliance, could journeymen, could they petition to use it? Absolutely. Okay. So this is really like a panel for the country. It's not an exclusive group. Yes. Oh, okay. Now I understand. Yeah. That's why it's so varied. You want to have different areas represented to come up with what parameters you wanted and to promote it in your region. Yeah. These are just the founding members. It's interesting that Canada is involved because Canadian whiskey has their own parameters. It is. That doesn't really interact with Kentucky and U.S. standards. So that's going to be interesting. This was great. This is kind of what they did with American single malt before all of those rules came about. Yeah. 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 All right. So the second story we have is from PR Newswire. Pinot Ricard launches new North American whiskey company. Pinot Ricard. Yeah. Pinot Ricard has reinforced its commitment and ambition to its American whiskey portfolio by establishing a new global brand company called North American Distillers. The new specialized business will be helmed by Richard Black, a seasoned Pernod Ricard executive with 23 years of leadership mm. in whiskey and cognac. Black will oversee the company's full operations in order to prioritize excellence and create a best-in-class organization emphasizing safety 
safety, quality, and sustainability. And the move aligns with Pernod Ricard's approach to its successful Irish and Scotch whiskey entities, Irish Distillers and Chivas Brothers. As Black said in a statement, American whiskey is a dynamic spirits category, and our portfolio shows immense potential for future growth. Our investments made in Jefferson's, Rabbit Hole, Smooth Ambler, Screwball, and TX Whiskey underscore our ambitious commitment. My mission is to harness this potential and drive a singular focus on these brands, driving us toward our goals and creating a top-tier marketing and sustainable operations team on the back of our people's deep-rooted expertise. It's kind of funny that they threw Screwball in there with all the other uh, whiskey. I know, I know. I don't know if I would have done that, but I understand <laughs> they probably they probably saw a lot of Screwball. Though. It's very popular, and right? We, we did it on the podcast, and we liked it for what it was. It's a liqueur. Sure, and we made some cocktails yeah, out of right. it. Right, if you want a peanut butter liqueur. It's fun. Yeah, it's fun. Yeah. Uh, but when people call it a whiskey, it irks us a little bit. Yeah. What I saw of this was it was a shot on the bow of Sazerac. Because okay. Sazerac is a big company, and they have a big stake in North American whiskey. And Pernod Ricard is like, oh, yeah? We're coming for you. About five years ago, I was talking to somebody who was an executive Pernod Ricard. Mm -hmm. You know, they had Jameson, and they had Absolute, Mm -hmm. and some big brands. But I said, you know, you don't really have a lot of crafter boutique whiskeys. And what the person said to me was interesting. They're like, well, you know, (laughs) it's not like loyalty. Like, if you drink Absolute, that's your vodka, you know? But mm. everyone's looking for the next best whiskey. You, oh. you, you have bottle A this summer, then someone will want to drink bottle B next summer. And I'm I like, mean, I'm sure there's some of that for sure. But there's people that we know that just drink one kind of whiskey and that's all they drink. That's right. So I, I didn't challenge them on it because we were having a friendly conversation. I thought they were wrong, short-sighted and foolish. Yeah. And now, now maybe they're correcting right. that. Because I mean, Jameson, Jameson, like, yeah, that's not going away. Right, right. But, you know, I think Woods for Reserve, Knob Creek, Basil Hayden, uh, Maker's Mark, a Wild Turkey would all all dispute what that person said. Sure. Like there's core brands that people are going to drink. And even I, even with all the whiskey that we drank, have my four or five brands that I always have a bottle of. Yeah. You know, Scott will always grab, maybe it'll be a 12 year Knob Creek or maybe it'll mm-hmm. be a single barrel Knob Creek, mm-hmm. but he still has loyalty to Knob Creek brand. That was his first love in whiskey. Mm-hmm. Knob Creek, Four Roses, a Bullet Rye. I used yeah, to make cocktails. I, I actually noticed for the first time I don't have a Four Roses in my house right now. Oh. I noticed it last night. It's a first time I would say in five years. So I'm going to probably go out and get a single barrel or the small batch. We should, select. Go, we should go right now. You want right. right now? Yeah, like it's called. <laughs> and we're back. Well, we're a little mangled. Oh my God, right. We have, my car's totaled. Right, but, yeah. but we have six bottles of each. Yeah, we're fine. All right, so the third story that we have in industry news, luxurylaunches.com. McAllen releases their oldest whiskey at an astronomical price. <laughs> I feel like they do this every month we I come know. out. They keep one upping right. themselves. Right. Now the McAllen that was in the crypt of Jesus. <laughs> Just roll back the stone. <laughs> right, 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 right. Roll back the stone. It was the empty crypt and a bottle of McAllen, <laughs> and that bottle's for sale now. All right, so when new and old and past and present converge, it can only lead to something magical, and it's here for us to taste. Mm. The McAllen has released its oldest whiskey ever in a stunning two-chambered decanter that they call Time Space. The outer chamber holds an 84-year-old scotch. <laughs> <laughs> I caught you while you were sipping water. <laughs> oh my god! Eighty-four years. An old Scotch. And yeah, I, wait, give me a second. Okay. A few moments later, the outer chamber holds an eighty-four-year-old Scotch, and the inner chamber holds a six-year-old Scotch, the first release from its new distillery. The circular decanter resembles a striking oak sculpture, further enhancing the natural color of the liquid, while the hypnotizing design symbolizes a wheel of time, representing the journey from past to present. All right, so the outside chamber is like an ounce and a half, and the inside chamber is (laughs) is 23 ounces. Well, I'll show you a picture of it after one more paragraph. Okay. So, uh, priced at an eye-watering... $175,000. Oh, very close. $190,000. Of course, I still went under. (laughs) Only two hundred of this limited edition have been created to celebrate the label's 200th anniversary. However, another version of the collection called Time Space Mastery is a single malt finished in 14 different types of casks and packaged in a similar circular bottle, but for a more reasonable $1,400. So here's what it looks like. Look at it. Oh. Isn't that cool? Oh. So it's like a wheel, almost. You've never seen anything like this, people. And so here it is separated. It is the most unique container I've ever seen. I don't know if I can even call it a bottle. The inner chamber looks like a bottle. The, the outer, outer chamber, chamber looks like, like a, a space station. It's a wheel. It's cool. 
It's yeah, cool. I mean, it, it is pretty cool. We'll never ever hundred ninety thousand dollars. We'll never see it in real life. Yeah, yeah. It's like no thanks. I, I'm good. I, I got can, my four I roses. Buy a used Bentley for that. <laughs> Would you though? Mm-mm. No. The reason I don't own a Bentley or a Rolls Royce is not just that. It's the fact that every oil change is like five hundred and seventy dollars. <laughs> <laughs> right. You blow out a tire and you're like, that's a thousand dollars. Yep. All right. So the last story that we have in industry news yep. is from Vine Pair. Super fast whiskey aging is here, but should we be doing it? Mm. Mm. As we've talked about before several times on the podcast, the biggest hurdle that new distilleries have is the time it takes to actually make... Wait, nudists have? No, new <laughs> distilleries. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Not nudist illeries. Yes, to me, the biggest problem with nudists is uh, frying bacon and uh, <laughs> not enough sunscreen outside the beach. Mm, yeah, okay. it's true. New distilleries have... Okay, thank you. ...is the time that it takes to actually make good whiskey, which is measured in years as opposed to vodka or gin, which can be produced in hours. But what if, instead of putting whiskey in a barrel, you could put the barrel inside the spirit? Of course, this is an idea that has already inspired a few distilleries, including Maker's Mark and Broken Barrel, just to name a few, with great success. However, they're using whole staves. So what if you take the concept a step further and use even smaller portions of wood, like Ed in college? <laughs> <laughs> Touche, good one. Oh, thank you. Well played. Well played, yes, good show. Well, several <laughs> distilleries are currently in the throes of investigating this process using various wood sizes from hockey puck size to one inch cubes to laser cut microstaves the size and shape of a finger. And they've also had some success in fooling experienced palates regarding whiskeys that can be aged enough in as little oh. as 24 hours. I mean, why? why? Yeah. Does, we don't need whiskey that fast. Okay, so here's what I'm getting to. Tom Licks of Cleveland Whiskey says that he's conducted 3,600 blind taste tests and his rapid age product against a highly respected Kentucky bourbon brand and consumers chose his product 54% of the time. And Doug Hall, a brain brew distillery in Newtown, Ohio, says his rapidly aged products are favored about 60% of the time. However, there is great skepticism among purists that these... And Ed. And Ed. And and me too. (laughs) That these methods can yield whiskeys that rival traditionally aged products. Heaven Hill master distiller Conor O'Driscoll says there's no substitute for time. Any enhanced maturation products I've tasted don't stack up. It's like instant coffee versus a really fresh espresso and andrew weibrink director of research and innovation at the independent stave company says these accelerated aging techniques really are just accelerated extraction techniques but there's more to aging than just extraction in fact he says there are four phases of maturation extraction oxidation reaction and subtraction and the problem with rapid extraction is that the rest of the components don't catch up also people don't just buy a product on a shelf they buy a story and their place in it which is where traditional whiskey has always buttered its bread so doesn't hastening the whiskey aging process kind of kill the magic for his part hall says no the whiskey being made today doesn't use the same grain doesn't use the same yeast woods or water filtration process everything has changed there's nobody making whiskey like they made it in 1850 there's nobody making whiskey the way they made it even 50 years ago tradition is a myth well i mean i I don't think he could speak for the whole industry like that but i understand what he's saying because he's the 3d printer of whiskey Right. Yeah. And so the fifty-four percent choose his overall. It's such an obscure thing. I feel like I'm dealing with the fake news that's everywhere. <laughs> Here's what I would compare it to. Yeah. You can make chili or beef stew in a crock pot, mm-hmm. and after uh, an hour, you can eat the chili. Mm-hmm. But after three hours, it's amazing. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Same. And you all know what I'm talking about. You cook a roast beef, you can eat it after an hour. But if you wait three hours, where it's just like flaking off the bone and all, all of a sudden it's magic. And I think that's what we're talking about here. Like, yes, in 24 hours you can get a product that is technically a whiskey. Honestly, I've never tasted it. I guess I owe it a sip if I ever come sure. across a bottle. I would absolutely be interested in yeah. what they talked about. They did a blind taste against a highly respected Kentucky Burby brand. Yeah. Which one? Because well, like, that we'll matters. Be- Doug Hall, yeah. listen, the Whiskey Tangent Podcast welcomes you to send us a sample. We're already biased against it. We admit it. But we're also two very legit guys. If it's good. Yeah, we'll say it's good. We'll say it's good. We're not in the industry. We have no dogs in this fight. I mean, if you're telling you're going to be as good as the white label Jim Beam and the regular <laughs> wild turkey, then all right, I believe you. that's possible. That's what I mean. It's like, and, which brand? And I would be happy to taste that. And if you could do that, that would still be impressive because they're the two leading sellers for their companies. And look, we do like the stave finished stuff that we've had from mm-hmm. the two that I mentioned, mm-hmm. Maker's Mark and Broken Barrel. And there are others that are 
are doing it. And there's yes. also ones that are doing it in smaller barrels. Yes. Like Corsair yep. and several other companies, especially small craft distilleries. Yep. So like we're not averse to right. We're wanting skeptical, to try it. but we'll drink it. Sure. Because I'm, I'm sure that's going to be a hell of a lot cheaper than the stuff that we're paying sixty, seventy dollars. Right. For. And it should it, be. It damn well better be. Right. And that's I think the whole purpose of doing it. Right. You right. get well, it out faster, so you can charge right. less. Well, what'd you get this for? Uh, my bottle, nine dollars. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, not so fast, Ed. That's not what I said. I said it's made quickly. I didn't say it's going to be cheap. Right. That's the end of the industry news. That's entertainment. Entertainment is next. That's right. So the first story I have in entertainment news is from foodandwine.com. And actually, it's all over the internet, but I just took it from this one. Beyonce has released her own whiskey brand. Oh, yeah. Really excited about that. Yeah. Beyonce knows Carter, the 32-time Grammy Award winner, has announced that she's partnering with Moet Hennessy on a new American whiskey brand called Sir Davis, which will be headquartered in her hometown of Houston, Texas. The spirit's name is a tribute to her paternal great-grandfather, Davis Hogue, a moonshine man and farmer in the South who lived during prohibition. Shortly before the pandemic, Beyonce, who's partial to Japanese whiskey, approached Moet Hennessy with the idea of launching her own spirits brand. And from the outset, it was clear that Beyonce had a vision for her whiskey, says Cameron George, longtime art bag ambassador and now global head of advocacy for the Sir Davis brand. This is the first American spirits brand that Moet Hennessy has ever launched that was built from the ground up instead of through acquisition. Mrs. Knowles Carter is not afraid to reinvent and redefine herself. And that's the actual aim of the brand to redefine the space of whiskey, starting with an MGP mash bill of 51 percent rye and 49% malted barley. The spirit was aged in American oak barrels, finished in former PX sherry casks in Texas, then blended and bottled at 88 proof in tall ribbed glass vessels reminiscent of vintage perfume and affixed with a bronze horse atop a black medallion. Also, long before it was launched, it was entered anonymously into a number of spirits competitions and won several awards. Retailing for $89, Sir Davis is available at select retailers across the United States, Tokyo, Paris, and London, as well as at sirdavis.com. Right, so first of all, the thing that caught my eye was it's a lot easier for celebrities to get into the vodka or tequila business. We see that a lot. Mm. You don't see as many coming into the whiskey industry. Because it takes time. Right, we just, we just right, which we just talked about. Mm-hmm. They were smart to research and, and realize that MGP is your best sourcer of high-grade whiskey in the country. Mm-hmm. And they chose a very unique mash bill, 51% rye, 49% malted barley. It's not widely used. Also, it would have been easier partnering with uh, Moet Hennessy to go into some type of a wine or some type of a champagne cognac. or some type of a cognac. Oh, Hennessy's right. Right. Or some type of vodka. The fact that they went outside of the comfort level of even that brand and got a whiskey from the ground up shows a lot of planning and a lot of forward thinking to create such a unique whiskey. Yeah. Uh, we've tried it. Yeah. All right. We did a quick taste on this. Yeah. So we were sent this. We'd like to thank Beyonce for sending us a bottle. That's right. And, Thank um, you, Beyonce. We're best friends now. Right. We're BFFs. <laughs> so Beyonce sent us a bottle, and we're not going to tell you what we thought of it. But you can see what we thought of the taste of it by listening next week. That's right. When the quick taste comes out. Yeah. You can make your own determination by going and getting a bottle between now and then and ruining it. <laughs> or, or drinking it along with us. Right. Or, yeah, you can get a bottle and open it next Friday. That's right. And listen to us talk about uh, the Sir Davis Whiskey by Beyonce. So I'm excited for people to listen to that episode. And also, I, I can't wait till Beyonce hears it, Scott. Yeah, me too. So I just want to mention the... Uh, awards that it did win anonymously. Oh, yeah, that's fun. So I thought that was really interesting. Uh, They won, and this was last year's awards, so the 2023 SIP Awards, they won platinum and best in class for American whiskey. They won a gold medal from the 2023 New York International Spirits Competition and the 93-point rating from the 2023 Ultimate Spirits Challenge. I think it's really interesting that they tested the market like that. Yeah, I I do too. Yeah, we didn't end up talking about that on the episode. No, 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 we didn't. I didn't know about that, yeah. Yeah, Yeah, so Beyonce. Beyonce Whiskey, check it out. Next week, foreshadowing. (laughs) Okay, so the second story is from bevnet.com. This is actually a little humorous. Uh, Derek Trucks. You yep. know Derek Trucks? Sure, I've played with the Allman Brothers. Warren Trucks, I think, is his uncle or father who's mm. in the Allman Brothers. It was and then his wife Trucks is, yeah, t- his band or wife, something. Right, his wife is, um, I think, Susan Tedeschi? Oh, and that's why it's named that? Yeah, Tedeschi Trucks. Gotcha. They're a very, very good band. A lot of fun. Yeah. Great jamming. So it's a Derek Trucks has a new whiskey with a cheeky name. Okay. <laughs> Multiple Grammy award-winning Derek Trucks, one of the most influential guitarists of the modern age who Rolling Stone magazine placed at number 16 on their list of greatest guitarists of all time. Whoa, 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 whoa. I would put him number 16 active. Oh, you're disagreeing with Rolling Stone? <laughs> Nobody does that. No. <laughs> Rolling Stone. There's always seven guys on that list that we've never heard of. Like, one eye McCoy from the 1931. He made a guitar out of a washboard and some telegraph wire. Really, James? James Jackson Brown. Right. Go wrote a song about it. Want to hear? Right. Here it goes. Ah, thank you very much. 
<laughs> so he announced late last month a new company set to release a line of limited bourbons bottled exclusively in 200 milliliter flasks called Ass Pocket Whiskey. <laughs> Love it. So wait, they're all 200 mil- Yeah. Oh, so that's so what? So they can put in your ass pocket. Right. So it's like a pint, right? A 200 milliliter. Yeah. It's smaller than a half bottle. It's fit in your ass pocket. Well, see, I remember when I was a kid, we would get a pint of something that you shouldn't be drinking, kids. But <laughs> when I was like 16 or 17, it would be like trying to get a half pint or a pint of Southern Comfort. Yeah. Right. You know, like. One of those little flasks. Yeah. You get like a little bottle of it. Yeah. Because you couldn't afford it anymore. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah, like yeah, I, but, I got $8. So 200 milliliter, that's like four shots. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So as they say on the website, ain't it a shame that so many people are buying great bottles of bourbon, but are too afraid afraid to open them because they are quote unquote collectible bourbon used to be about enjoying and experiencing the liquid how did this fear of opening start and how do we make it stop introducing ass pocket whiskey their first release is a heritage kentucky straight bourbon premiered exclusively at this year's bourbon and beyond festival held september 19th to 22nd so right podcast is coming out in louisville kentucky where festival goers sampled will sample yeah. have sampled and purchased it at the ass pocket whiskey bar with remaining bottles made available exclusively at asspocketwhiskey.com where fans can sign up to receive updates on this and future releases I think we should reach out and see if Derek wants to send us a bottle. Oh, that would be great. Let's do that. Maybe two bottles, so we each have our own tour of million right, bottle. That's right. Well, we both have asses. Yeah, <laughs> and pockets. Wait, oh, what's another pretender song? I got ass in pocket. <laughs> it's brass in pocket. Oh, damn it. That's right. <laughs> Pretty close, though. <laughs> I'm special. Yeah, so special. So special. I gotta have your ass. <laughs> Give it to me. <laughs> All right, all right. Um, what's it retail for? Do we know that? Price, that is a good question. I have no idea. It didn't say. Oh. I would be surprised if it's more than 20 bucks. But um, if you go to asspocketwhiskey.com, you might be able to get stuff that they weren't able to sell at that festival. Now, listen, I want to be clear. Derek Trucks is an amazing guitar player. I just think 16 all time, you don't realize how many great guitar players you just kicked in the nutsack. Right. Because, man, he still has a lot of time to go. You sure. Know? He's not like 80. Right. So what, where's Jeff Beck then? I don't know. Where's Jimmy Page? Where's Eric Clapton? Where's Richard Blackmore? Where's Prince? Frank Zappa? I mean, I haven't gotten to any of the metal guitar players or Andy Rhodes. Right, or or the obscure ones. Or Tony Ioni from Black Sabbath. Mm. Or the five other guys in the Allman Brothers. How about Dwayne Allman? How about Dickie Betts? I don't even think he's the best in his own band. (laughs) But once again, no offense to you, Derek Trucks. You're an amazing guitar player. We're just trolling Rolling Stone. We're trolling Stone. (laughs) uh, (laughs) All right, so up next... True crime. True crime, everybody. <laughs> All right, so the first one we have in true crime is from SundayWorld.com. Nearly 1,000 fake spirits seized in large-scale South African crackdown. Mm. Late last month, a total of 958 bottles of fake Jameson Irish whiskey and Smirnoff vodka have been seized by cops in South Africa. That's terrifying. The dodgy drinks were discovered during a joint enforcement operation tackling counterfeit spirits in Soweto near Johannesburg. One suspect has already been arrested in the operation, which was carried out by provincial police and brand protection specialists employed by the South Africa Liquor Brand Owners Association. The worldwide fake alcohol trade is worth $1.4 billion US, and much of that counterfeit liquor contains high levels of contaminants, like methanol, which as we've reported before, can lead to damage to the eye, skin, respiratory system, central nervous system, and gastrointestinal tracts with high levels of exposure leading to coma and even death. In fact, recently three people died in nearby Zimbabwe after they had consumed counterfeit Jameson whiskey. That's exactly the problem. It'd be exactly. one thing if you're like bottling your own and I know I'm taking a risk, but to think I'm drinking straight JMO yeah. and then going blind or something. Exactly. But the bottom line is 907 bottles, it sounds great, but at 30 bucks a bottle on average between Smirnoff and Jameson, yeah. it's not even 30 grand worth of product. It's a drop in the bucket. But thanks for doing something. And this is the reason <laughs> I don't drink whiskey in South Africa. I think that's <laughs> why I don't go to South Africa. And I don't know that I will. Yeah. All right. Ah. 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 Ain't going to drink no whiskey. <laughs> In South Africa. Ain't going to play Sun City, is right. it? It's wrong to use an apartheid song. <laughs> it's an anti-apartheid song. An anti-apartheid song just for the punchline to fit our joke. I don't know. Is it? I don't know. You can make fun of Nazis and you can make fun of apartheid. Okay. I think that's fair. I think Mandela would laugh at it. <laughs> oh, he would. He was a pretty good guy. Yeah. All right. So the second story in true crime is also from SundayWorld.com. Man steals whiskey, gets arrested a lot. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> Listen All to this. Right, sure. Yeah. William O'Driscoll, 40, of County Cork, Ireland, was observed taking a bottle of whiskey from a Dunn's store, sort of like an Irish Target, and CCTV footage confirmed that he did not pay for the whiskey and left heading in the direction of the town of Macroom. And later that day, police received a report of a man trying to enter houses in that city. When they arrived, O'Driscoll was found in a highly intoxicated state, staggering in the middle of the road in his bare feet, holding a half-finished bottle of whiskey. At his hearing last month, O'Driscoll pleaded guilty to theft and public disturbance after the court had heard that at the time of the offenses, he was out on bail for another matter and that he had previously had 67 convictions, including theft, public disorder, and drug offenses. However, the judge remanded O'Driscoll to continue his bail because he'd brought 30 euros to court as compensation for the theft and was currently on a waiting list to enter a residential drug treatment facility. I just want to say this. Is it the worst part of this story that I'm thinking you were that drunk off a half a bottle of whiskey? Because (laughs) I've drank half a bottle of whiskey so much and just went out and hung out and just talked to people like a normal person. Right. He was staggering in the middle of the road with no shoes. I honestly think I'm a about a quarter of a bottle in right now. <laughs> right. I'm not even lying. I'm right. thinking, if he had drank the whole bottle, depending how fast you drink it, absolutely. Mm. Absolutely. That's a big difference. Yeah. I've, I've drank a whole bottle and you know what? It hasn't always gone great for me. It hasn't, no. So this poor guy has really felt bad after reading yeah. that he had actually brought 30 euros to court to pay for them. It's like, oh, I'm sorry. I paid for that. Like, he has 67 convictions. 67. Mm-hmm. Like, why isn't he in a drug for treatment facility now? Like, what's going on? Like, why not at 30? Convictions. <laughs> Why not you know? in 15 or six yeah, seven. or two? Jesus. I, I'm really fired up about Scott's this. Yelling at me. I'm not the judge. <laughs> I know, I'm not yelling at you. Uh, So, yeah, that's why we love true crime. I know, we do. All right, so this one, assholes. Ready? Assholes coming. This is the asshole story. Asshole loop loop. That guy I kind of felt bad for, this guy, no. Okay. From the Lexington Herald Leader, man fires gun outside Buffalo Trace. Earlier this summer, James E. Endy of Caneyville, Kentucky, was arrested after firing a gun outside the Buffalo Trace distillery as camped out patrons lined up to buy special bottles of bourbon. When the Frankfurt Police Department arrived at approximately 7 a.m., they found a man who appeared intoxicated and immediately took him into custody. According to an account of the incident posted on Facebook by a witness, quote, a man came barreling into the distillery's parking lot at high speed, parked in a handicapped spot, got out, and went to talk to somebody he knew in line. The pair went back to the car. The driver pulled out a bottle of whiskey and an AR-15. He discharged a live round into the air and drank from the bottle. People scattered. The cops showed up a few minutes later, and he turned into a little baby. Needless to say, it was an eventful morning. Andy was later charged with first-degree wanton endangerment with a firearm, public intoxication, trafficking marijuana, and possession of an open container in a motor vehicle. I didn't even know any of them were a crime in Kentucky. <laughs> I thought you, I thought people shot off guns all the time down there. It was... Kentucky shade. Now, by the way, if he was shooting a Buffalo Trace because they won't release more of the antique collection, I could understand that. Like, <laughs> right. It's you know, said I, in the air, right, not at right. Buffalo Trace. I yeah. might go there one day and just be like, <laughs> put my gun and say, give me Antique 107 right now. <laughs> Bring me one of the Wellers. Bring him out. Oh, my get, God. <laughs> Give me a pappy, too, while I'm here. <laughs> Might as well. You're already there. You're right. already going to be arrested. Right. That's all people ask about. Did you ever have pappy? Did you ever have a Johnny Walker Blue? I had someone ask me that yesterday. Oh, pappy, right? I'm like, no. George T. Stagg, for me, if I'm getting anything from that, mm. or the W. Or L. The, or the LaRue Weller, which William is the best LaRue whiskey Weller. that I drank this year. Oof. William Lou Weller. Right. The antique collection one. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing. That Ed will go down and shoot up Buffalo right. Trace I won't, to I, get one. Oh, don't say that. Now they're going to. Now they're, well, I don't know. You just said that. I said it. Did I misinterpret you? <laughs> I said, well, if I was going to fire a gun in Buffalo Trace, that's what it would be about. I don't know, guys. You decide. You heard what he said. <laughs> yep. All right. So the next thing we do is all the new whiskeys that we're going to feature that you can buy this month. So we have some really good ones. We oh, got, excited. Yeah. So uh, the first one I have on my list is a Baker's 13-year single barrel bourbon. <sighs> I know, right? <sighs> so... Apparently last year, Beam offered up a Baker's 13-year, releasing the extra-aged single-barrel bourbon to great success. Now it's back again. Bottled at the same proof, but $20 more. That's 107 proof, 13 years aged, 73% corn, 13% rye, 10% malted barley, fruit, vanilla, caramel, oak, and toasted nuts. The MSRP is $150. It's interesting. A 13-year. Yeah, isn't it? Because what is it? It's it's traditionally Seven. seven, right? Yeah. It's almost double. Almost double. Definitely buying that. Yeah. And that's coming out now? It's out. Oh, let's go get it. <laughs> get the car. <laughs> Second one I have is Blue Note. 
has put out a honey rye cask. Mm. Mm, the latest limited release from Blue Note is a straight rye first aged for three years before being emptied into a honey infused cask for maturation, then bottled at cask strength. It's 117.2 proof. Wow. Three years aged plus some time in the honey infused, which is undisclosed. This is a 95.5 rye. I don't know if it's uh, MGP, but maybe. Light apricot, vanilla, allspice, oak, caramel with hints of wildflower and honey, $65. I mean, they've never let us down in Blue Note. Yeah. But you said the honey rye. Normally, it's a honey rye for me. Like, honey, why are you mad? <laughs> Not honey rye. Honey, no. why? Honey, why? <laughs> <laughs> it's probably good. We just had the Garrison Brothers. Garrison Brothers. Honey. The honey do. Right. There was a thing about that, too. Honey do this. Absolutely. Okay, so the next whiskey we have, actually the next pair of whiskeys, uh, Booker's and Little Book have both put out two new expressions. So eighth generation master distiller Freddie No right. has unveiled two new expressions. So he's not taking over Booker's, but he's doing this sort of distaff Booker's expression called the Reserves. So it's a new annual expression, the first extension of the Booker's line, and it commemorates Booker No by offering a whiskey that Freddie believes his grandfather would be making if he were still alive. It's comprised of eight different bourbons from eight different barrels, ranging in age from eight to 14 years and bottled at cast strength. So I couldn't find any tasting notes yet, and it's $130. All right, which is about 25 bucks more than a regular Booker's. Yeah, and he's putting out a new little book called Little Book The Infinite Edition 1. So it contains whiskey laid down by three generations of the No family, including Father Fred and Grandfather Booker. And each year, a new whiskey will be added to the existing blend, creating an evolving series that fans can taste as the spirit ages over time. So kind of like an infinity bottle. Mm. 119.3 proof. This one is, the edition one. Uh, it's anywhere between seven and 20 years, the whiskey's included. The mash is not disclosed. Uh, dark stone fruits, deep brown sweets, caramel vanilla, a hint of smoke, $200. I mean, not crazy, but it's not insane at it's $200. It's got 20-year whiskey in it. Right. It's not insane. Yeah. And They have um, the exact specs on yeah. their website if you want to well, look Well, we're going to have dinner with Freddie No. We are. And his father, Fred No. Yeah. We're, we're scheduled to have dinner with them when we visit Kentucky. Yes. Which is true. This is true. All this right? is all true. Right. An intimate dinner with yeah, yeah, 60 other people. No, see, you, you ruin it. Why do you have to say that? <laughs> because I'm, everything I was saying was true. We are going to have dinner with them. It's just going to be with some other people. I can't just let me live the magic. Let the people get turned on by it. <laughs> because it makes it sound important. You ruin it. You're so honest. Because everything I said was true. I didn't make one lie to the people. You didn't. You made no lie. So the truth about it is I'm going to talk to Fred No and Freddie No, going there to have dinner with them. And we're going to shoot up Buffalo Trace on the way out. Oh, my God. <laughs> now we're going to have restraining orders on us before we even get to Kentucky. They're not even going to let us in the state. Booker No and Fred No and Freddie No are, like the whiskey said, three generations of whiskey makers for Jim Beam. And we're going to get to talk to two of them, and I think that's going to be amazing. It's very and, exciting. And I would really like to leave that dinner having one of them scheduled to come on the podcast in December. Yeah. The, the next one is a uh, few has a new whiskey called Chicago Smokeworks Malt Whiskey. The new whiskey from Illinois-based Few Spirits, see episode 73 if you want the full story about them, commemorates the Great Chicago Fire of 1871. It's a malt whiskey distilled from cherrywood smoked malted barley and rye. Its proof is 93. It's four years aged. The mash is not disclosed, but it is a malt, so it's at least 51% malted barley. So dark molasses, honey graham cracker, cherry jam, cereal grain, caramel apple, baking spice, and mellow smoke, 50 bucks. And what is it, Honor? The Great Chicago Fire of 1871. So, see, this is how I get myself in trouble, Scott. Here so, we go. <laughs> so, in 70 years, is it going to be the great 9-11 whiskey? You know what I mean? It oh. tastes like airplane fuel. Oh, and, I mean, it's like, right after that disaster happened, the city was reeling. People were dead. Blocks of the city were on fire. I love few. You know I love few. I'm just questioning that this is okay. Mmm, tastes like burn pit. Mm. <laughs> So funny enough, I just saw an article about how the newest generation, Gen Z or whatever it yeah, is, yeah, yeah. they don't know because they didn't experience it. They weren't right. born or they right, were two. Yeah. And so right. like these kind of tragedies, it's kind of like Pearl Harbor was right. to us. Right. We didn't experience it. We only experienced it through our parents and grandparents. Right. So it does kind of lose some of its gravitas. But there's film on it. I watched the film of Pearl Harbor. And I got the well, just... Well, film on 9-11, too. Right. So, I, listen, I, I'm not attacking few. I just struck me as interesting, the, celebrating the Great Chicago Fire. Like, it's just interesting that you're putting a whiskey out to commemorate yeah. an event that was absolutely horrible. It's like 153 years ago, though. I know. Yeah. I know. Yeah. I, it's just how my mind works. So, start over and say about what the whiskey tastes like, smells like. <laughs> no. I don't want to... Go ahead. Just say it's something fun. about it. Is it cherry jam and cereal greens? Oh, sounds good. <laughs> $50. So 
so, 50 bucks. I will say this. Super cheap. A few has never tried to take advantage of any of us. I bet it's a delightful whiskey. All right. So the next one, oh, Garrison Brothers. We just did an episode yeah. on them. Episode 77. Go back and listen to that if you haven't. Garrison Brothers was a great episode. Awesome. And foreshadowing, mm. on our last call, we will be drinking another mm. Garrison, yeah. an uptick, as well as another... Ooh. uptick of the blackened expressions that yeah. come out from Metallica. Yeah, so that'll be two so weeks tune from Tune into our last call for this season. Right. So the new Garrison Brothers expressions that they're putting out, well, they're not actually new, but they're new annual releases. So they've released Laguna Madre bourbon, aged in Texas for eight years, spending half that time in new charred American white oak barrels before undergoing a secondary maturation in French Limousin oak casks. We're not drinking that one. It's 100 proof. No, it's not that one. Four years originally and four years in the French oak. It's 75% corn 14% red winter wheat, 11% malted barley, as all of their whiskeys are. Maple, brown sugar, baking bread, vanilla, oak, cinnamon, caramel, molasses, and green pears. MSRP, three fifty. Enjoy that, everybody. <laughs> and a new expression of their cowboy bourbon, which we did taste. Yes. And loved. Loved it. Garrison Brothers has released a special 10th anniversary edition of their cowboy bourbon, housed in a custom-designed black box with gold interior, adorned with a 2024 medallion. It's 140.2 proof. Oh, my God. Same mash bill as the other one. And... And will make you go blind in one eye for half an hour. Aged at least eight years. Dried... Fruit, warm pecans, brown sugar, hot Saigon cinnamon, raisins, licorice, vanilla, melted chocolate fudge, and white chocolate dipped strawberries, 280. Nice. All right. So the next one we have is Glen Morangy, Signet. Nice. Reserve. Oh. Highland. Oh. Single malt scotch. Oh. Glen Morangy is releasing an even rarer version of Signet. It's luxury expression as a new limited annual release called Signet Reserve. The innovative whiskey was originally released in 2008 using chocolate malt, but this one goes a step further by finishing their fully matured regular... In sin- your mouth. <laughs> oh my God. Play the finish in your mouth. What? Oh my God. <laughs> oh, you're, you're mixing up. That's the Glen Morangy Bukaki. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. It's totally Go different. Ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> Finishing their fully matured regular signet in Pedro Jimenez. <laughs> Sherry cast. Nice. 92 proof, 15 years aged, plus one year in the Pedro Jimenez, 100% malted barley, dark chocolate sponge cake, espresso, hazelnut cream, orange zest, muscovado sugar, toffee, fudge, cinnamon, raspberry, and tiramisu, 345 Right, so it's pricey, but I mean, if you are going to finish a Glamouragi whiskey, let it be in my mouth, I'll be honest. <laughs> it's... I guarantee you that is a delicious whiskey. It's, it's what out, it's meant for. It's out of my price range. It's meant to be in your mouth. Right. It's out of my price range. And their regular Glamouragi Signet is a treat, not even once a year, but probably like biannually. Yeah. By decade. <laughs> Shout out to you, our, our Scotch buddy, Joe. I don't know if you want to tell your wife about this one, though, but I know you want to get it. Yeah. The only reason I included it because you love the Signet so much. I do love and, the and, Signet. And it's delicious because we all had that on... I forget the episode number, but uh, that's our Scotch Fest episode. We only did one. Yes. <laughs> uh, the next whiskey we have is the, I thought there was interesting just because of the name. It's called Natterjack, the Mistake Irish Whiskey. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Natterjack launched in 2019 by Jordan Via, formerly a co-founder of Breckenridge, and now at Savage and Cook, wow. ha- has released a triple distilled blended Irish whiskey that was initially aged in bourbon barrels for three and a half years before being finished for two years in new number four char American oak casks. Mm-hmm. Twice as long as normal, owing to a mistake by their suppliers, hence the name. Mm-hmm. It's 92 proof, five and a half years aged, 80% grain, 20% malt whiskey. The tasting notes are caramel, toffee, oak, vanilla, dark chocolate, dried fruit, honey, and butter, $59. All right. I'd take a run of that. Sure. I mean, we love Irish whiskey. We're always looking for new Irish whiskey brands. Yeah. Famously, we had 15 that one night in New York. <laughs> yep, 15 Irish whiskeys in one night. It was epic. It was epic. Uh, the next one we have is Old Elk. Ed likes the whiskey, hates the name. Cognac cask finished wheat whiskey. $9,000. No, go ahead. <laughs> Old Elk's new cask finished expression is a wheat whiskey that was initially aged for six years before being transferred into cognac casks made from French Limousin oak. 95 proof, up to seven years aged. It's 95% red winter wheat, 5% malted barley, tangerine, apricot, pear, orange peel, light brown sugar, butterscotch, wintergreen, clove, dark cherry, dried oak, and black pepper. MSRP. Only 90. Do you know, Garrison Brothers uses that red winter wheat. They do. In their stuff yeah. too, right? Oh, you know who does those? Maker's Mark. 
Maker's Mark does, yeah. yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, Remus Repeal Reserve. Oh. Series 8 is out. Oh, is it out now? Nice. Yeah. yeah. Ross and Squibb, a.k.a. MGP, is back with another Remus Repeal Reserve series release, their eighth, which serves as a bit of a departure for the brand. Past editions have been 100 proof and utilized up to six different bourbons. This new blend is 101 proof, so not that much of a departure. <laughs> oh, wow, they went crazy. <laughs> but only consists of three bourbons. So 9% of it is a 12-year, 21% rye bourbon, 24% is a 10-year 21% rye and 67% of it is a 10-year 36% rye. Hmm. I don't have any tasting notes yet. It's $100 as normal. It's been 104 years yeah, in a row. They've, uh, definitely they've been incredibly consistent and they haven't snuck it up like 105, 110, yeah. 117. Isn't that interesting? It is interesting. They've yeah. kept it at 100. I thought they should have maybe moved this up to 101. I was just going <laughs> to say that. <laughs> Uh, two more whiskeys. Yep. So we have 2XO, French oh. Oak, straight Kentucky bourbon. 2X is what I wear all the time. <laughs> and sometimes 3X. People go 2X? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> A new yeah. member of its ongoing Oak series, which is meant to showcase, quote unquote, everyday whiskeys that are priced significantly lower than their other offerings. It uses master blender Dixon Deadman's double oak process, which involves a piece of charred oak threaded through stainless steel chains that are inserted into the barrel while the whiskey ages. Mm-hmm. In this case, oak scraps sourced from cooperages across France. It's 92 proof that age and mash bill are not disclosed. It's pepper, vanilla, caramel, oak, maple, bananas, baked bread, white chocolate, and anise. 50 bucks. I mean, that's the cheapest thing they've ever put out. That's why I included it. Absolutely. Yeah. So this is their Oak series, which apparently is cheaper than their regular stuff. All right. Well, we should take a shot at this because sure. there's other stuff is like, I don't want to buy I mean, a hundred something dollar one bucks. is good though. Oh, you've had it. That's you, the one I had at Doug's that one night. Right. It was good. Yeah. I don't know if they're all the same, but that right. one was really good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and the last one we have Woodford Reserve Distillery Series Blended Malt. Mm-hmm. The newest member of Woodford Reserve Distillery Series intended to show off its creative side is a blend of two malt whiskeys. The first is American single malt aged in used Woodford Reserve bourbon barrels and then finished in ruby port casks. Mm. The second component was distilled from a mix of five different malts. Mm. It's 90.4 proof, which it always is. It's nine and a half years aged. The mash is not disclosed. Baked green apples, orange marmalade, cherry with malt oat, flaxseed, light leather, drying tannins, clove, cinnamon, and dark cocoa. It's 65 for a 375 milliliter bottle. So... Ah, it's not crazy, right? Yeah, 130 for a full bottle. This isn't their distiller's right. choice. This is distiller series. Oh, and there's no. Another, is, yeah. I don't think it's worth it at 90 proof. Not for that price. Oh, all right. How old is it? Nine and a half years. I mean, people will get it. It won't be me, though. Oh, but wait. Would I get a 375 for 65? Right. Hmm. Yes. I probably <laughs> would do that because why not? Yeah. I was thinking I had to buy a whole bottle with 130. I forgot that the right. whole concept of what you were talking about. <laughs> right. It's like as if we shared, but we're actually not sharing. Right. Right. We could split a bottle for like 30 bucks each. So let's go get it. <laughs> oh, my. Right. We could share right. even Drink, this size. It's 90 proof. Drink the whole thing and be like, hmm, let's go out and get some pizza. <laughs> All right, so that is it for all the new whiskeys and all the news. Good ones, yeah. The last thing that we do is what's coming up on the podcast. So next week on 927, we're doing a bonus short of Beyonce's Sir Davis. A quick taste of that. The mash bill fascinates me, Scott. It does. I can't wait to taste it. 51% rye and a 49% malted barley. We've only really seen that one other time on the podcast. That's right. And we talk all about that on the short that's coming up on the 27th. Can't wait to share with people what we think. Yeah. The next week on 10-4, the first week of October, we're doing our last call, summer 2024, where we recap all of season 11 and preview season 12. Yes. And that is it. If you find any of the whiskeys on our list interesting, go out and grab one. You know, if it's something in your price range or something in your palate, go get it. It should be fun. And hopefully we'll be back very soon, bringing you another episode of news and what bottles are available to buy. That's right. For the Whiskey Tangent Podcast, I'm Ed. I'm Scott. Cheers, everybody. Later. Later.